the matter is resolved in the affirmative. And that concludes general business. We'll now move to the matter of public urgency. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 23 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As, I res as a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator McKim. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice today that I pr propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The need for the Morrison government to take to the upcoming Global Climate Ambition Summit a pledge to increase its 2030 emissions reduction targets in lines with the science, noted, noting that the UK has announced a target of 68 per cent emissions reduction by 2030. Yours sincerely, Senator McKim. Is that proposal supported? Yes, it is. A call. I understand informal arrangements have been made. I ask the um, clerks to set the clocks accordingly, and I call Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. And I move that uh, the matter of public urgency be that the Morrison government must take to the upcoming Global Climate Ambition Summit a pledge to increase its 2030 emissions targets in line with the science, noting that the UK has announced a target of 68 per cent emissions reductions by 2030. Well, folk might not recall how pathetically weak Australia's targets are, if you can even call them targets. 26 to 28 per cent reduction on 2005 levels by 2030. In less jargonistic terms, Australia is currently the highest per capita polluter on the planet. If by some miracle or by the dodgy accounting tricks that I'll talk about in a minute, we meet those targets, Australia will still be the highest per capita emitter on the planet. These targets are pathetic. They are not strong enough. They are not based on science. They are written by the fossil fuel industry that donates to this government and to the opposition, and they are writing the death warrant for the Great Barrier Reef, for our agriculture sector um, and for so many lives and for so much human misery as natural disasters just increase. Now, the United Kingdom uh, recently recommended that their pollution be uh, that their targets be increased to 68 per cent. Their government actually listened to their scientific advisers and they increased their 2030 target by that amount. When Prime Minister Boris Johnson is making more sense than your own Prime Minister, you know you're in trouble. Uh, and it's about the one thing we'd like Scott Morrison to actually, Pr Prime Minister Scott Morrison to actually listen to Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson on. But as I've mentioned, our two big political parties are completely in the pockets of the oil, coal, and gas political donors, um, who also offer them very well-paid lobbyist jobs once they leave Parliament. And I think all of Australia knows that. Uh, now, the Bureau of Meteorology has some very sobering news. It says Australia is not on track for the two degrees that we signed up to as a citizen of this world uh, to keep global warming to. In fact, we're on track for 4.4 degrees over our landmass. That's goodbye to the reef. That's goodbye to most of our productive agriculture. And that's hello to an awful lot of devastation that is entirely unnecessary because we have the skills, the nous and the resources to transition to 100 per cent clean energy as soon as possible. Uh, but we're not seeing any of that from this government. On the reef, we just had the final warning bell sounded by the IUCN with their three-yearly World Heritage Outlook uh, released last week, now saying that the Great Barrier Reef is critical. It is the uh, most strongest listing that can be given to a World Heritage Site. And it's not surprising because we've lost 50 per cent of the coral cover of the Great Barrier Reef in five years with three severe bleaching episodes. We're meant to be heading into a La Nina, but there's concern that there will be yet another bleaching. And this is the last warning this government's going to get before UNESCO decides whether or not to list the reef as World Heritage in danger. Now, that would be factually accurate, but it would decimate the tourism industry. What we need this government to do is adopt strong 2030 emissions reductions targets. This is the critical decade. But today, today they want a pat on the back because they've said they're not going to cheat on their homework. They've said they're not going to use the Kyoto carryover credits and they expect some kind of praise when it was five 
five years ago that most other nations voluntarily said they wouldn't use their carryover credits, and when Australia is in fact the only nation that in that initial climate agreement in Kyoto were allowed to increase our pollution. The only reason we have carryover credits is because we were allowed to pollute even more when all of the rest of the world decided to tighten their belt. So I'm sorry, but we are not going to praise the Prime Minister um, for saying that he won't use dodgy accounting to somehow meet our targets. The other dodgy accounting point is that they're now trying to claim that they're on track to meet our targets because, again, we're relying on a provision uh, about land use that no other country is relying on. If you take out that dodgy accounting, Australia is in fact polluting more than we were in 2005, which is meant to be our baseline year that we're meant to be 26 to 28 per cent better than um, by the end of this decade. We are not on a good trajectory. This is a critical decade, and we need this government and the opposition to stop taking the dirty money from coal, oil and gas and start listening to the science bodies, stop defunding them and actually adopt some climate targets that we can amply meet, that will generate more jobs, that will protect our reef and our way of life, and set us up for future economic prosperity. Stop putting your own personal interests ahead of the nation's. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, well, uh, in that contribution there from Senator Waters, uh, we really only heard us compared to one country, the United Kingdom, and I'll come to that country in a second, but, but there was no comparison with any other country in the world. So I, I, I for one, at first thought maybe we'd gone back into some twilight zone when we were once again a colony of the United Kingdom. We were, only, we were just being told to do uh, from our, uh, we're going to do, according to Senator Waters, what our colonial masters want us to do over in London. And yes, our colonial masters uh, in London would love us to cripple our own industry so they can continue to compete with us. They'd love us uh, to impose huge costs on our own country uh, that many other nations are not doing. Uh, but I, for one, prou am proud and cherish the independence that this nation has achieved since we threw off uh, the colonial chains and became an independent country. So, no, I don't think we should just slavishly follow uh, what Mr Johnson wants to do in London. Good luck to him. He's the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. He is the Order. Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Order. and he can decide what the policies are for the United Kingdom. Uh, uh, in this country, in Australia, we should decide what we want to do with our, by Australian elected officials, and including our Australian uh, Prime Minister. And, uh, uh, Senator Watt was over there saying, am I a Republican? I'm not a Republican. I'm a constitutional monarchist, and that does give us independence here in this parliament. But I was surprised to hear Senator Waters almost not just be uh, a monarchist here, but perhaps an absolute monarchist as well, because I think I think, uh, I think Prince Charles and Prince Harry they want us to do these order. things as Senator well. Senator Canavan, Senator Waters on a yes, point of uh, order. Yes, point of order. Thanks. I'm a dedicated Republican, uh, so perhaps Senator, Senator Canavan Waters, could withdraw his not, outrageous that is flair not on a my point character. Of order. That Resume I'm a... your seat. Resume your seat, Senator Canavan. You have the call. <coughs> well, well, thank you, uh, um, Acting Deputy President. But uh, well, I'd say to Senator Waters, start acting like one. Uh, uh, don't just adopt the policies of a, another country because a proud Republican would actually uh, want to cherish our own independence and cast our own uh, uh, course through the world. Uh, but I want to come to these other countries as well because uh, uh, Senator Waters, as I said, only mentioned United, the United Kingdom. Uh, but in fact, when you look closer around the world, uh, New, Zealand, New Zealand is not meeting our, our cousins, our good friends, New Zealand are not meeting their Kyoto targets. The Kyoto targets come due this year. They come due in 2020. So New Zealand has about three weeks uh, to meet its Kyoto targets that is failing to meet right now. It's only reduced its emissions by just under 3 per cent when it promised to, do, to reduce them by 5. And as many, much as Ms Jacinta Ardern wants to go around the world and, and, and spruik the fact that she is committed to net zero emissions by 2050, the fact remains that their country has not met the, the, the commitments they made just 10 or 15 years ago. So how can they be trusted to do something in 30 years' time? Likewise, Canada. Canada has barely changed its emissions. Uh, it is not meeting its Kyoto targets. Japan is not meeting its Kyoto targets. Almost every other country in the world is not meeting its targets. And then, of course, countries like China and India they don't even have any uh, real targets to meet under Kyoto or Paris, for that matter. But we are. We are. We are. Uh, as Senator Waters said, she she thinks it's through dodgy accounting, which I'll we'll, we'll come to. But we are one of the few countries that's actually meeting our targets. The main other problem, though, I have with the uh, implication here in this motion 
that we should follow the United Kingdom and reduce our emissions by uh, somewhere in the order, I suppose, of 68 per cent by 2030, is that will actually do nothing for the environment unless we consume more stuff. Well, less stuff, sorry, unless we consume less stuff. Uh, because I didn't hear anything from the Greens, and never hear anything from the Greens, that we should somehow uh, 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 not buy as many solar panels from overseas, or wind turbines, or, 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 or electric cars. All of these things are made using coal. All of these things are made uh, often in countries with much worse environmental uh, records than we have. Uh, so, so it takes every time we put up a wind turbine, it takes about 900 tons of steel. Uh, Acting Deputy President, 900 tons of steel, uh, and it takes to, to make that steel. It takes around 800 tonnes of coking coal to make uh, one tonne of steel. So times 800 by 900, uh, you get a lot of coking coal embodied in those wind turbines. Every time, every time you want to build a, a wind turbine, it's 2,500 tonnes of concrete. That typically uses a lot of coal too in the kilns uh, to heat up uh, the lime and make concrete. So that, that also is a huge carbon emission impact. Uh, and again, we don't hear uh, the need for less wind turbines, at least from the Greens we have in this chamber. But of course, Bob Brown and Christine Millen are doing great work opposing wind turbines in Tasmania and all power to them. Uh, but this mob in here are, are cheering on uh, the extra carbon emissions we would get from wind turbines. Solar panels. Almost all of our solar panels are imported from China. Almost all of them. Where does China get the energy to, to power its factories to produce these cheap solar panels? Coal. A lot of it from our coal. It used to be our coal, at least. Our coal. They use coal uh, to produce solar panels, which we then are happily import cheaply. Now, I would say to the renewable energy industry, if we want to really save the planet, let's make the solar panels here. I'd support that. I'm not against solar panels. I'm not against renewable energy. But let's make it here. Rather than make it dirty in dirty factories in China, why don't we make the solar panels here? All right? why, why do we allow these companies to take government subsidies all the time and then just import them from another country where the jobs are created there? Let's make them here in this country at least in a cleaner fashion. And of course, if we reduced, if we were to reduce our emissions by the 60 or 70 per cent, even if we were to reduce it by 100 per cent, even if we were to get rid of our carbon emissions tomorrow, in the words of Dr Alan Finkel, that would do virtually nothing, nothing uh, for the environment, because of course Australia only accounts for roughly 1.3 per cent of the world's emissions. So even if Australia was to get rid of all of its carbon emissions tomorrow, uh, it would not make a single difference to the world. It would not change the temperature, and that was confirmed. It was confirmed by our chief scientist, Dr. Alan Finkel, when uh, a good mate of mine, a former senator, Ian Macdonald, asked Dr. Alan Finkel at Senate Estimates, "What would the impact be of reducing the world's emissions by 1.3 per cent?" And Dr. Alan Finkel replied, "Virtually nothing." And he's absolutely right. It would do virtually nothing uh, for the planet. But we want to. We want to apparently push on. Push on. Uh, and continue them down this path where we self-flagellate ourselves for no uh, actual environmental outcome, when we cost jobs in this country but don't help the environment at all. And the latest absurdity here is this push to give up our Kyoto credits, give up our Kyoto credits, give up the fact that we've overachieved uh, uh, on on carbon emissions. Uh, we have to do that. Yet there is never, never a call from the Greens to penalise those countries who have underachieved. Why is all the criticism of our country? Why isn't there any criticisms of other countries? It's because the Greens don't really like Australia. They don't like our country. They don't stand up for it. They certainly don't want to put Australia first. Uh, so there's never any criticism of other countries not meeting their Kyoto commitments. And so, order, Senator Canavan, Senator Waters, on a point of order. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. A point of order, reflecting on a member of this chamber, and wrongly, I might add. So can I ask Senator order. Canavan to Senator, withdraw? Uh, let me rule on this point of order first. Uh, you referred, he referred to the Greens as a party, which is no different to you referring to the Labor and Liberal parties and making inferences about their motivations under the standing orders and conventions. Referring to a party as a whole uh, does not infringe the standing orders. There is no point of order. Senator Canavan. Thank you. Uh, and I've certainly touched on it today. So they don't take Australia first, but they don't put Australia first, the Greens, because uh, because they never criticise other countries. If we are going to have to give up our Kyoto credits, why shouldn't other countries uh, uh, have, to, have to be allocated Kyoto debits 
Why, why shouldn't other countries get Kyoto debits for all the underachievement they have presided over over the last 10 or 15 years? That seems pretty logical to me. And so if we are to give up these Kyoto credits, we should, we should make other countries do more in the next period to catch up, like countries like New Zealand, like Canada, like Japan, many other, others around the world. The final point that I want to make is I don't, know, I don't think we should give these things up uh, because I do agree with one part of what Senator Waters said. She rightly said that the reason we have these Kyoto credits, the reason that we have got around 400 million tonnes of credits, uh, it's all a bit funny money, but we've, 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 we've reduced our emissions by 400 million tonnes more on the carbon accounting than we, we budgeted for or we promised to under Kyoto. Almost all of that, I agree with Senator Waters, almost all of that is because we've stopped farmers being able to develop their own land. So over the last 30 years, Order. Senator Canavan, Senator Waters. Yes, look, it's an, I'm afraid it's another point of order on um, reflecting and misquoting me, uh, which he Senate, well knows. Senator so can you Waters. please be accurate in your Senator, representations? Senator Waters, you have set a very good example yourself in making accusations about other people, but he did not breach the standing orders in this case. Senator Canavan, you have the call. Thank you. And uh, yes, the Greens certainly can give it, but they can't take it. The, 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 um, uh, the Senator Waters was right that what we've done is we've stopped farmers developing their own land. We've stripped them of their property rights, provided no compensation to them, no compensation whatsoever. Told them that little part of your block over there that you might have wanted to develop in the future, you bought your block, mining wanted to develop more food on it. You can't touch that anymore. And we've got this ridiculous situation where that, that is apparently a carbon credit, and that lets us spruik the world and say how good we are. Well. If we have a surplus of these, this, these good, good intentions or good outcomes, why don't we give them back to farmers? Why are we giving them to the world? Why don't we give those 400 million tonnes back to our nation's farmers so they can grow more food? That seems like a good idea. Why don't we, why don't we, so if, we, if, we, if we have locked up so much land, too much land? Order. Oh Senator McKim. Acting Deputy President, I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Quorum required. Ring the bells. Quorum present. Senator Canavan, you have the call. Uh, well, look, thank you, um, Acting uh, Deputy President. As I was saying, um, uh, we should put our, our country first and our farmers first. Uh, that's the simple proposition I have, uh, that if we have somehow got this surplus of, of credits, let's give our farmers a break. Uh, they've been doing it pretty tough over the last decade with drought, some, some suffering, floods. And as I said, on top of that, in the last couple of decades, they've had their property rights stripped away from them. So let's give them some of those rights back so they can do something for our nation that we should all be proud of. And that's grow food uh, that we all enjoy, high quality food. Some of it will be exported, but we do benefit from it too. So let's give our farmers a break and put our country first and reject this silly motion. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, well, I think here we are, um, some 11 years on since the Greens um, 
sided with the National Party and voted down the CPRS. And it's you know, really frustrating that we're here again with this urgency motion today uh, without a pathway forward on how we as a country and we as a parliament are going to deal with the uh, very urgent uh, case of combating climate change. It feels like we had this motion or this debate at the same time at the end of last sitting period, last sitting um, year, uh, when we it was a decade after the um, opposition to the CPRS, uh, and it really that triggered what has now become known colloquially as the climate wars in this country. And still there isn't a pathway forward. Still people come into this chamber and bicker and point and we're going to be better than you guys and you're not doing enough. And yet the people of Australia deserve, I think, some more leadership from politicians in this place. Um, you know, communities are worried about what's happening to our climate. People are worried about what it means for their jobs. Um, our kids are worried about what it means for their future, and yet here we are, 11 years on, having pretty much the same discussion. You know, I mean, that's that's the depressing nature of this. And you know, I know the Greens come in here and they're holier than thou on this on this subject, but you are complicit too. You come in here and you point the finger and you vote down things like you did 11 years Order. ago and look Senate, where we Senator are now. Senator Gallagher, I just remind you to address your comments Thank through you, the Thank you, Mr chair. Acting Deputy President. But look where we are now. And it's very easy for, for parties in this place to project the blame onto others rather than to actually look and see what role they have played. And no one has been perfect. But the answer of how we're going to deal with climate change, how we are going to deal with the impact on people's lives, how we are going to deal with the impact of a warming planet, what it means for people's health, what it means for their jobs, what it means for the way they conduct their lives, is only going to happen when we all come together, realise the magnitude of the problem and work together, despite our differences, to map out a pathway forward. And that isn't the approach the Greens political party has taken in this place. Um, when you were given the opportunity to work with, your, you know, with the more progressive side of politics, you chose another way out. Only then, only then to change two years later and vote for a scheme that wasn't as good. Um, that's what you did. And here we are, 11 years on. and. Not, not a, we haven't made any progress. We've got a government that should be held to account that has been woefully inadequate in the way that they have dealt uh, with climate change. We've had, we've had a decade. We've had Order. under this Senator government. Senator Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator McKim, I remind you of Standing Order 197. Interjections are disorderly. Your leader was given the courtesy of being heard in silence. I ask that you extend the same courtesy to other senators in this place. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. And where those of us in this place who do believe in climate change and do, who do want to see stronger action and who do want to see a pathway to secure jobs and to support communities who will be affected by this transition to help you know to to make sure that they have good jobs good high paying jobs and that they aren't concerned about what's going to happen for their community their kids that we are able to support that where where that where those part those people work together you can actually deliver a reasonable outcome but again you know the political imperative of um, the greens which really is to attack labor electorates and make sure that you know, you're blaming Labor for everything instead of focusing wholly on the inadequacy of this government. You know, when we were last in government, emissions came down by more than 15 per cent. Under this government in the last seven years, they've flatlined and have only reduced by 1 per cent. The Paris commitment from Tony Abbott and uh, Scott Morrison is for a 26 per cent Order. emissions Senator reduction Gallagher, cut. I remind you to use the correct titles. So the Prime Minister. And former Mr. 
How is Mr <laughs> Abbott is fine. He's Mr. no longer Abbott. in this place. Mr Abbott and the Prime Minister is for a 26 per cent reduction cut by 2030, and the government is nowhere near on track to meet this. Their own projections show that we'll only reduce our emissions on current policy settings by just 4 per cent over the course of the decade. And we are becoming increasingly isolated on the world stage, with only 70 per cent of our trading partners, with over 70 per cent of them, committing to net zero emissions by the middle of the century. We've got all of the um, peak uh, groups, whether it be the National Farmers Federation, the Australian Industry Group, the Business Council, all of the commu peak community organisations, the ACTU, all committed to net zero emissions by 2050. But we haven't got that commitment from our government. And part of the reason why we haven't is because people remain so divided about what the right thing to do is. You know? And part of that problem is because our side continues to bicker. Like whatever happened, why, why wouldn't those that believe in climate change and want to see greater action on it come together? work out what we're after instead of coming in here and trying to blame each other and you point at us and tell us how it's all Labor's fault and there is no, there is no commitment to work together. You know, look what happened in the ACT when the progressive side of politics, when the progressive side of politics worked together. The ACT is powered by 100 per cent renewable energy. Why was that? Because the progressive side of politics put aside, didn't put aside their differences, worked out on a way to deliver a good public policy outcome. And I know, because I sat in that room, and it wasn't the Greens political party that forced our hand. It was because we both wanted the right outcome order. for our community. Senator Gallagher, and Senator Gallagher. Resume your seat. Senator Still John, a point of order. It is with the deepest sincerity that I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Quorum required. Ring the bells. Quorum present. Senator Gallagher, you have the call. Uh, thank you. And I think those little procedural um, stunts there um, just seek to e amplify the argument that I'm making, which is that you're not interested. The Greens are not interested in actually delivering the outcome here. What they are interested in is getting their social media um, video out, pointing the finger at the major parties, making themselves the, those that are without any fault. And the minute someone draws attention to their tactics and the way they're operating and the fact that we are going nowhere in terms of placing pressure on this government to actually, on their woeful record when it comes to climate change, is part of the problem. You, know, you, you didn't come in here seeking to resolve it. You, you seek uh, you don't seek to compromise. You don't seek to collaborate. You don't seek to do. Senator Gallagher, again, I remind you to address your remarks through Thank the chair. Thank you. The Greens don't seek to do anything that's actually constructive or that might um, deliver the outcome they say they seek. 
Um, and this urgency motion is a classic example. I mean, the motion um, makes it seem that the uh, I think it's a 68 per cent target by the UK. But what you don't say is that it's based on a 1990 levels. You make it look like they're doing. Um, you're, you're using this, the UK order. target. Senator Gallagher, resume your seat. Senator McKeown, a point of um, order. Just on uh, off the back of your previous ruling. Um, Acting Deputy President, when Senator Gallagher says you, referring to the Greens, she is most emphatically not speaking to the chair. Senator McKim, that is true. You also, though, need, if you wish to have that level of adherence to standing orders, to remember Standing Order 197 and the interjections are disorderly. Senator Gallagher, you have the call. A serial offender, Senator McKim, on the interjection front. But the motion, um, as the urgency motion as it's put, has I think the reference to the UK has announced a target of 68 per cent emissions reduction by 2030. What they don't explain there is you're not measuring like with like in terms of the debate that's been currently had in Australia about um, mid-2030 um, emissions reduction targets because the UK target is based on 1990 levels and because of that this motion is misleading and the opposition won't be supporting it. However, if you had been factually correct, if you hadn't been seeking to mislead, Senator Gallagher, resume oh, your for goodness seat. sake, this is the Senator, sixth interruption in Senator ten Gallagher, minutes. Senator Gallagher, resume your seat. Senator McKim, on once a again, Senator, the senator uses the word "you" when referring to the Australian Greens in direct uh, contravention of your previous two rulings, Chair. You are correct, and Senator Gallagher, I will remind you for about the fifth time. Please refer or make your comments through the chair. Why oh, they're so touchy this afternoon? Um, but the opposition will not be supporting. Well, yeah, yeah, Order. radio, radio. Senator Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator McKim, I remind you of Standing Order 197 and the fact that you are willfully and consistently refusing to comply with the standing orders. Senator Gallagher, you have the call. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. And, um, we won't be supporting the motion because it is misleading in the way that it has been written, and I think that was probably deliberate. Um, and I look forward to the day when the Greens come to the Labor Party with our shared view on the fact that stronger action needs to be taken on climate change and the fact that we have a shared view that um, we should be asking more and requiring more of the Morrison government when it comes to action on climate change. Uh, when they come to us with a motion that is factually correct and when they collaborate with us and cooperate with us so that we are in a position to support it. Uh, thank you, Senator. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you. Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I'm reminded of uh, when Grandma and Grandpa dropped the kids off uh, after they filled them with sugar. And, uh, I think what they've done is driven, driven uh, the kids today to the, to the, to the Senate chamber. Um, look, uh, in terms of this debate, uh, and noting I, that I come uh, to this place from an engineering background, I, I'm almost a little bit amused at the way there's this arbitrary uh, declaration of what the, uh, uh, what the emission target ought to be. Uh, like we're able to sit here and, and make a statement that it should be uh, this amount by this time, and then someone else wants to kick the, the ball a bit further or, or, or uh, have some other tactic. What we really need to do is we need to understand that we're, what we're trying to do is have energy that is clean, uh, that is uh, reliable, okay, and that is affordable. That's what uh, I think everyone is trying to achieve, and just throwing out targets of of one of, of one sort, and then uh, uh, someone else coming back with a different target, and then a few months later a different target is called for. We should actually approach this in an in an engineering manner. We should actually uh, be developing a long-term national strategy for emissions reduction, and we should be. Uh, uh, whilst it's okay to, to go into uh, to such an endeavour with some sort of requirement in mind, we actually need to work through and, and uh, determine how that might be achieved and in the execution of that plan uh, 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 what the cost is 
what the outcome is and all the things that are necessary to achieve or, uh, a particular aim and indeed, and indeed whether the aim is in actual fact possible. That's the process that we should be taking and doesn't seem to happen here. We just have politicians standing up and saying, this is the new number that I want to declare today as, as the answer. We need to develop a strategy that is mindful of those goals that I talked about and that's mindful of the need uh, to uh, create job opportunities along the way and to grow the economy, uh, to maximise the benefits, minimise the cost and do so in a manner that is uh, without risk. And we want to make sure when we do that, it is a national strategy whereby we uh, uh, have uh, the federal government working hand in glove with the state governments and also working with local councils. And um, we can't do that if we're playing this um, emission reduction target football that we are. Um, I would encourage all to uh, perhaps pick up a, a, a book on system engineering, look at how you might approach a complex problem like this. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, you know, the government needs to very seriously look at a, the national plan that I talked about, a long-term strategy to, to emission tar targets, have it open for everyone to, to look at and, and uh, criticise. Uh, that's the only way we're going to get a, a sensible outcome, not by um, uh, shouting and, and um, trying to outcompete each, each other in this chamber. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. I think Senator Van has the call next. You have a point of order? Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, quorum's been called. Quorum is present. Uh, thank you. Senator Van. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. And it's great to be in here to speak on this uh, MPU. It's, uh, and I thank uh, Senator McKim for it. It's like a Dorothy Dix session for, for us on this side. And uh, no doubt he'll try another one of his tricks uh, through this, which I'll, I'll welcome because then I get to have a drink of water when I've got a bit of a rough uh, dose of hay fever today. So, um, now, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Morrison Liberal government takes climate change seriously and we are, in, and we are serious about delivering real outcomes, because it is outcomes and action that matter, not motions in the Senate, not grand declarations of targets without a plan to achieve them. We on this side of the chamber are ambitious to reduce our emissions, but unlike those opposite, we actually have a plan. Those opposite coming to this place beat their chest, jump up and down, calling for greater action. <clears throat> but when you ask how they would achieve that, what do you hear? What do you hear, Madam Acting Deputy President? You hear crickets. It is clear that those, especially at that end of the chamber, are all talk and no action. They're all bluster and tokenism, positioning and politics. Well, 
we in the Morrison Liberal government are not playing politics on this issue. While those then enter the chamber are talking the talk, we are getting on with walking the walk. So let's talk about the facts, Mr Acting Deputy President. Climate change is a global issue, and Australia as part of the global community is taking action. We are 100 per cent committed to a strong and practical global action in response to climate change. We are 100 per cent committed to the Paris Agreement. It was, after all, a Liberal government that signed the Paris Agreement. It was a Liberal government that adopted a 2030 target. It was a Liberal government that adopted a clear plan to meet and beat our 2030 targets. It was a Liberal government that remained committed to the Kyoto Protocol when others wavered. It was the Liberal government that beat our 2020 target by 459 million tonnes. And it will be a Liberal government that will meet and beat our 2030 target. Why, Mr Acting Deputy President? Because of the Liberal government being in charge, we've been able to set ambitious targets and then reach them, all without increases on taxes on everyday Australians and especially small businesses. Those that enter the chamber when it, uh, and those opposite winning government decided on, the only way to achieve emissions reductions was through the highly hurtful and harsh carbon tax. When Labor left government in 2012, their forecast was that emissions in this year, in 2020, would be 630, 637 million tonnes, and that was with a carbon tax. Last week, we learned that our emissions are 513 million tonnes, 20 per cent lower than what those opposite forecast that we would achieve. And guess what else, Mr Acting Deputy President? We got rid of the carbon tax. When you compare our track record with the track record of those opposite, we've done far better. When you compare our track record with similar economies, we've done far better. Australians' emissions fell faster than the OECD average, faster than Canada, faster than New Zealand, faster than Japan and faster than the United States. Canada is not on track to meet its 2020 target. Canada's emissions have virtually unchanged since 2005. In New Zealand expect that they will only achieve their 2020 target with the use of carryover. That is, in New Zealand's emissions are down only by 1 per cent since 2005. As of 2018, well before COVID-19, our emissions were down more than 13 per cent. And the latest data has Australia's emissions down by 16.6 per cent on 2005 levels. For those opposite to come in here and say we're not doing enough shows how little they care about facts, actions or outcomes. This Liberal government is getting on with the job. The pathway to meaningful reductions in global emissions is through the development and deployment of new technologies. We're investing in future energy technologies that will support jobs, strengthen our economy cut energy costs and reduce emissions. We are doing this without compromising the affordable, reliable power that Australians rely on. Our technology investment roadmap is focused on reducing the cost of energy, not raising it. <coughs> Pardon me. It is about making sure that there are more jobs and more investment, not less. Getting these technologies right will support 130,000 new jobs by 2030, many of those in regional Australia. And they will maintain Australia's position as a world-leading exporter of food, fibre, minerals and energy, and all at the same time as reducing our emissions. Mr Acting Deputy President, the widespread global deployment of these technologies could substantially reduce or eliminate emissions in sectors responsible for 90 per cent of the world's emissions. We want customers to choose lower emitting technologies because they make sense for them, for their household or for their business. This is not about a government telling businesses or households what they should do. Instead, it is about making sure that those lower emitting alternatives are there and at as low a cost as possible. This is a policy built on liberal philosophy. 
philosophy that has worked well for Australia for decades. Our plan is to reduce the cost of new technologies, not raise the cost of existing ones. In the budget, we also announced our $1.9 billion investment package to create jobs and bring new technologies into play. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, while Labor and the Greens come in here, beat their chest, put forward tokenistic motions, the Morrison government is getting on with it. We're dealing with the issues and we're getting great results. Reducing emissions, achieving our targets, reducing the cost of electricity for all Australians. We are focusing on delivering on the outcomes that matter, not tokenism, positioning or politics. Australia should be proud of our achievements. We should be proud of the fact that we are a world leader in energy, including renewables. We should be proud of the fact that we are one of the very small group of nations that have met all their international achievements. And we'll achieve this while supporting our key domestic sectors, like mining, like agriculture and like manufacturing. And it was interesting in the uh, report that Mr. Senator McKim quotes, and we talk to the, uh, the UK government in their plan. They talk about delivering part of their emissions reductions through the use of advanced nuclear power. Now, perhaps the senators at that end of the chamber could come in here and have a sensible debate about nuclear energy one day. If they're serious about bringing down, if they're serious about bringing down emissions, as opposed to just propping up their mates who, who sell solar panels. So. We celebrate Sorry, Senator, Australia Dean, uh, Senator, Senator Walters. Thank you, uh, uh, Acting Deputy President. Point of order, adverse reflection uh, by the Senator. It's actually their side of politics and that side that takes money uh, from vested Senator, interests, not the Australian Greens. Senator, that's, him to withdraw. Senator that's a debating point. Uh, Senator Van, you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy Chair. And I'll just wrap up quickly by saying we celebrate Australian achievement. We believe in this country, we believe in enterprise, and most of all, we believe in technology, not taxation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, scientists and businesses and parliamentarians and the Australian community have been calling for the government to take action on climate change. But over seven long years, they refused to listen stubbornly indifferent to the consequences of inaction. Now the Australian government's failures have caught the attention of international leaders who are calling on Mr Morrison to take action on climate change and to commit to strong emissions targets. Not that long ago, five international leaders, including Prime Minister Boris Johnson and French President Emmanuel Macron, wrote a letter to Scott Morrison, my apologies, Mr Morrison, demanding that Australia make a bold new commitment at the Climate Ambition Summit. It couldn't be a clearer message. The world is looking to Australia for leadership, and this government fails the test. Australia has already lost 10 years to baseless fear campaigns against climate action, and we can't afford to lose another 10. When Labor was last in government, emissions came down by more than 15 per cent, and under the Liberals and Nationals we see no such progress. Eleven years ago, almost to the day, the Liberals, the Nationals and the Greens voted down Labor's carbon pollution reduction scheme. And eleven years later, as a direct consequence of that shameful act, Australia is still waiting, still waiting, still missing an effective climate change policy that will see a reduction in our order. emissions. Sorry, Senator Rice. A point of order, Acting Deputy President. Um, the Senator is misleading the chamber. There is no connection at all with that the Greens' is Senator rightful Rice. Um, Senator Rice. voting That's down the, the continue-polluting regardless Senator scheme Rice. with our current Senator emissions. Rice. That is a debating point. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. And indeed, the Greens political party are touchy about this question because it was a great mistake 
and it's a mistake for which they have refused to apologise, a mistake they cannot even acknowledge, and it's a, the consequence of that is they continue to be completely unable to participate in constructing a broad-based support, broad support for climate action. And so Labor will not be supporting the Greens' urgency motion today because, yet again, it is characterised by misleading information, and I'm sure that the Greens will see that as no impediment to posting online a whole lot of information, misrepresenting Labor's position on climate action, polluting the political debate with misinformation. But let's be really clear. Labor is the only party with a track record of legislating for climate action, and it's the only party with a capacity to build a broad-based consensus to transition us to a carbon-neutral future. Because right now, at the government, under this government, nothing is happening, and that is by design, and that will not change until we change the government. According to recent research from the University of Melbourne, the cost to Australia of not delivering on the goals of the Paris Agreement, a goal that requires net zero emissions by 2050, is a staggering $2.7 trillion. Excuse me, Senator McAllister. Senator Wish Wilson. Just, just to keep you on your toes, I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. It's much appreciated. Uh, thank you. A quorum has been called. Oh, look, they, were, uh, see, they just go park next door. That's what they do. Quorum is present. Uh, thank you, Senators. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much. Um, before the Greens uh, called quorum in this debate, a uh, step that they've taken on multiple occasions for purposes that they're yet to explain, um, I was making the point that the costs of inaction are very significant for the Australian economy and at a time when we are looking for sources of growth, new sources of economic activity, new jobs, it is incredible that the government cannot see the opportunity that is staring them in the face. This is a goal that the CSIRO says will deliver higher wages, higher incomes and lower power costs. It's a goal that the University of Melbourne says will deliver 20 times greater benefits to the economy than any costs. The Business Council says getting to net zero by 2050 will mean $22 billion of new investment per year. All major Australian companies and the National Farmers Federation and the Australian Industry Group are committed to net zero emissions by 2050. 73 countries, including the UK, Canada, France and Germany, have already adopted it as their goal. All states and territories in Australia have already promised to be carbon neutral by 2050, and the Australian and the international community is united in this commitment. But it's the Morrison government that refuses to accept the target and to deny the science, to mislead and lie to the community and refuse to take action. And these failures have a real-life impact. Our government should go to a Climate Action Ambition Summit with a plan for climate, energy and economic reform. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Rice. Acting Deputy President. I want to take you back 40 years. When I was 20, and I was studying meteorology at Melbourne University, and I had just learnt about the science of the greenhouse effect and the likely resultant changes to the world's climate from the burning of coal, gas, and oil. And I was shocked. And I thought, this is serious. And I thought, the world needs to be doing something. And that day changed my life. 
It made me realise that if the world needed to be taking action, then so did I. I had a responsibility to do what I could do to protect our planet, and that resolve has continued through to the current day. But 40 years of the world not taking action in line with climate science, with my country, Australia, leading the way in inaction over the last seven years after the highlight of the Greens' Labor government, the Gillard government, from 2010 to 2013, that has been demoralising, because we know now that we have not done enough. And yet we've got governments and the opposition that are still trying to debate the physics and basically to say that what we are doing is, is going to be sufficient, and with the Labor Party unwilling to even commit to a 2030 target. We know that the really damaging effects of the climate crisis that there are really damaging effects already baked in. We are living with the bleaching of our coral reefs, with the largest living organism on the planet, the Great Barrier Reef, having lost half of its corals in the last 25 years. We are living with the places we love being destroyed by fire, our world heritage Gondwanan rainforests, living time capsules that survived a continental breakup and a planetary mass extinction event being destroyed by the worst fires in thousands and thousands of years. And we are living with the deaths of three billion animals. And if we named each one of those animals and we read out their names at a rate of one per second, it would take us 96 years to finish paying respect to them. And we are living with millions of people every year being forced to move due to natural disasters, with global heating causing more frequent and intense disasters and nearly one billion people living in areas of very high or high climate exposure. And we are living with immense grief of knowing that we are all part of the web of life on this planet and feeling the pain and the trauma of that loss. And that the reality that life is going to be more difficult, more dangerous, less safe for our children and grandchildren than it has been for us. And the denialism from the government and the Labor Party pretending that they're doing enough, playing with figures, compounds our grief in refusing to commit to shifting away from the mining expert, export and burning of coal and gas and oil at the speed and the scale that's required. They create despair and disillusion, especially among young people who know they are the ones who are going to be living through this crisis. So 40 years on, sadly, I no longer have optimism that we will act in time to turn this crisis around, but I continue to have hope that the world will see sense and, at some stage, take the urgent action that's required to shift to a zero-carbon economy at emergency speed. I'm no longer optimistic that Australia will be a leader, but I have hope that we'll be dragged along as a laggard. And my hope is kindled when I see commitments like that of the UK government committing to reduce its emissions by 68 per cent by 2030. I know that Australia could do likewise. So on behalf of every person and every creature on this planet, on behalf of future generations, I urge the government and the Labor Party to build hope and to dispel despair by similarly committing to ambitious carbon reduction targets in line with the science. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting De Deputy President. And there we have it. Emotion and hyperbole, not one bit of science. In serving the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to firstly point out that the Greens last week wanted to declare a climate emergency because New Zealand did. Not because of the science, but because New Zealand did. The Greens wanted to declare a climate emergency because Japan did. Yet Japan is building coal-fired power stations hand over fist. Now the Greens want a pledge to increase 2030 targets in line with the science. Yet listen to what the CSIRO has divulged. I asked them, where's the danger? They said they've never said there's any danger due to human production of carbon dioxide. Never. And they said they never would. So why the policy? Why the Greens rants? Secondly, the CSIRO admitted that today's temperatures are not unprecedented. That means we didn't cause the mild warming, that cyclical natural warming that ended in 1995, and it's been flat since. Then, ultimately, the CSIRO relied not on empirical scientific data, it relied on climate models. Models, unvalidated and already proven wrong. 
What's more, the reliance on models means that they have Excuse got me, no sorry. empirical scientific evidence. Excuse me, Senator Roberts. Senator Rice. Order. The senator is actively misleading the chamber. He the is totally misrepresenting senator the CSIRO's Rice. climate no science in his Rice. contribution this afternoon. There's no point of order. It's a debating point. Senator Roberts. Thank you. What's more, in, in the last few months, we have, we have made videos and consulted with 17 eminent scientists, including those who've worked with NASA's data, who've worked at senior levels of the USA administration, who've been contributors and lead authors to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, renowned climatologists, world experts in their field, sea levels, atmospheric gases, atmospheric physicists, mathematicians, former senior Bureau of Meteorology meteorologists, geologists with international awards, former CSIRO re senior researcher, first and only auditor of the Global Historical Climate Network and the climate modelers. This is not a matter of urgency. It is a matter of integrity. It defines the Greens as the deniers of science. So let's now go to the number of— Senator Waters. President, I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Quorum required? Yep. Ring the bells. Stop the bells. Quorum established. Senator Roberts. So where's the science? Well, I asked the Greens that on Monday, the 9th of September 2019. It's been 445 days since I asked them to provide the empirical evidence proving that carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate. 445 days of zero. 445 days since I challenged them to debate me, Senator Waters and Senator Di Natale at the time. Zero. It's been 10 years since I first challenged Senator Waters in public in Brisbane on the 7th of October 2010 to debate me on the science and on the corruption of science. Zero. It's been almost five years since I've done it again, did it again in June 2016. There's no science from the Greens, and they rely on emotion and rants because this is not a matter of emergency. Urgency. It is a matter lacking integrity. It defines the Greens as deniers of science. Why? All because Morris Strong pushed this nonsense. The fundamental cause for propagating the lies about science are due to human weakness. Gutless politicians afraid of differing from a false majority. Here's how he did it. 1972, the United Nations Environmental Program started with Maurice Strong as leader. 1976, a ban on DDT. 2006, the World Health Organization reinstated DDT's use. 40 to 50 million people died because of Morris Strong. 1980, Villach, Austria. 1985, Villach, Austria again. These are the times when Morris Strong had handpicked. Uh, Senator, sorry, Senator Roberts, just resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson. Yep, a point of order, President, on, on relevance. Um, I know you allow a la fair bit of latitude in these debates, but Senator Roberts talking about DDT on a motion about climate change, um, I feel, is not uh, relevant to this debate. Senator Wish Wilson, that's not a point of order. Thank you. Senator Roberts. President, and it is not a point of order because it goes to the heart of the UN. It is a corrupt, anti human organisation. And it is in line because not a matter of urgency, it is a matter lacking integrity. It defines the Greens. And their action is in line with the science, means do nothing. Senator McKim. 
Well, um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. State the utterly bleeding obvious. Our climate is breaking down around us. Now, stop and think about what that actually means for a minute. It means that the life support systems of this planet are failing. And what do we get from the major parties in this place in debates while the climate is breaking down around us? We get denial and obfuscation from the government benches, and somehow from Labor, what we're getting is, oh, it's all the Greens' fault. Well, let me remind Senator McAllister, it is not the Greens, it is the Labor Party that still supports the Carmichael coal mine. It is not the Greens, it is the Labor Party that supports fracking the Beedaloo Basin. It is not the Greens, it is the Labor Party that supports fracking the Galilee Basin. It is not the Greens, it is the Labor Party along with the Liberal Party that still support the tens of billions of dollars worth of direct public subsidies straight into the pockets of the fossil fuel polluters in this country. But somehow, from Senator McAllister and Labor, it is all the Greens' fault. Well, what I've noticed in this debate as it's evolved over the years and the decades is that the rhetoric of climate denialism is shifting. It's shifting away from challenging the science, and I, ex I, I exclude Senator Roberts here for obvious reasons, but the mainstream debate, the mainstream climate deniers in this place have shifted away from trying to dispute the science because the science is overwhelming. So what they do now is work on delay, and one of the primary ways that political parties work on delay is by setting targets off in the never-never. And the, the party most culpable of doing that in this place is the Australian Labor Party, who have got a 2050 target and fine, have a 2050 target, no problems there, but stop using it as cover for not having a 2030 target because the science is abundantly clear. We've got a decade or less left to take serious significant and, yes, I will say it, radical action to save the life support systems on our planet, to fix the climate breakdown and any political party which does not have a 2030 target might as well be a party of climate deniers. Every day the majors refuse to set a 2030 target in line with the science. They decide that the millions of dollars they get from their deep-pocketed fossil fuel donors are worth more and are more important than the lives of ordinary Australians and ultimately the climate that sustains all life on this planet. And every day they fail to have a 2030 emissions reduction target in line with the science. They condemn our country to more summers like the one that we just suffered through. They condemn the Great Barrier Reef to death and they condemn millions of species of animals to extinction around this planet. And what have they sold out all those things for? That's right, a few dirty dollars from their fossil fuel donors. Shame. Shame. Senator Steele, John. Thank you, uh, Deputy Acting Deputy President. As a young person, I speak uh, to this motion. Uh, as a member of a generation that is staring down the barrel of a climate crisis, whose future looms ahead as one defined by drought and hunger, fire and flood. Fire and flood. We, the young people of Australia, have been demanding action from this parliament for decade after decade. And yet all we hear in return is the same nonsense, the same robotic talking points delivered by one side of the chamber and another. From one side of the chamber you get excuses 
and the literal talking points of the fossil fuel industry flowing forth into this place. And on the other side, the side where the opposition should sit, you see nothing but spinelessness, spineless cowardice in the face of the greatest crisis ever to face the human species. In my state of Western Australia, we have a state Labor government flush with hundreds of thousands of dollars funneled to them by Chevron, by Woodside Petroleum, and at their behest they are selling our future down a gas-poisoned river. They are fracking the Kimberley, and they dare on the eve of our state election to bring forth a so-called climate policy which does not contain within it an emissions reduction target, which does not retain within it a renewable energy target. On the eve of a uh, season of weather in our state which proves to be one of, the damaging, one of the most damaging in our history. At a moment in time in the history of our state where we as a community have come together like never before to keep ourselves safe from COVID and are now united in our desire to rebuild in a way which enables us to tackle the climate crisis. The McGowan government is making things worse. They are opening up our state to the wholesale selling of massive tracts of our land, massive tracts of country, which have been sung and stewarded for tens of thousands of years to the gas giants that are lining their government pockets. It is one of the greatest acts of intergenerational theft in Australian political history. And it is a condemnation upon this place that right now there are children organising across the country for strikes and marches at a time when our focus should be on our education, on our mental health, on planning what we want to do with our lives. We are putting all that aside to plan demonstrations, to be able to plead with this place, to grab it by the strap of the neck and say, please act. Our future is at stake. It is a shame that that should be required of our generation. Senator Steel, John, your time has expired. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those, uh, those, <laughs> the ayes were moved to the right of the chair and the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes and Senator Seward as teller for the ayes. There being nine ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. <laughs> <laughs>